The Battle of Adobe Walls, in which a handful of buffalo hunters beat a large body of Kiowa, Cheyenne, and Comanche warriors in June of 1874, had been widely celebrated. But the Staked Plains War, a bona fide campaign conducted without the benefit of military assistance or sanction against the Comanches in 1877 by a party of those same buffalo hunters, has scarcely been noticed. Yet the Staked Plains War, culminating in the Battle of Pocket Canyon, was far the most daring of the two, and its results were more important, since it broke the warlike power of the fierce Comanches. The feud between the buffalo hunters and the Indians was of long standing. The hunters had practically exterminated the great buffalo herds, and the red men bitterly resented this wanton slaughter of their chief source of food. There was no love between the two groups. By the summer of 1876, the buffalo had been so killed off that only in the Texas Panhandle could they be found in sufficient numbers to make hide hunting profitable. The hunters were therefore moved to that section. With them went the traders. Charles Rath of the Dodge City firm of Rath and Wright, whose trading stores had been on every buffalo hunting frontier, established a post on Double Mountain Creek, a tributary of the Brazos. Far to the east lay the Comanche Reservation. The Indians were supposed to be peaceful, but the Comanches had not really felt the brunt of the 1874 war, and many of them were still unconvinced of the white man's power. Besides, the government was slow with its rations, and constant reports came to them of the continued extermination of the buffalo, their buffalo, in the west, contrary to the promises made to them. They grew very restless. The Comanche were one of the great fighting tribes of the plains. General Richard I. Dodge called them the most cunning, the most mischievously artful of all the United States Indians. For two centuries they carried on a constant war against Mexico. Their warriors were as familiar with the passes of Chihuahua as with their own Red River country. When Texas became independent, the Comanches extended their hatred to the Texans and long distinguished between Texans and Americans with whom they were friendly. One of the Comanches' most celebrated exploits was the sacking of Parker's Fort in northern Texas. The Comanches, led by Peta Noconi, the Wanderer, captured the fort and killed nearly everybody in it. Among the prisoners were two children, one a little girl named Cynthia Ann Parker, granddaughter of the elder John Parker, in whose honor the fort and later the city were named. The girl was 13 years old. Peta Nakoni later married her. She bore him three children before she was recaptured by the Texas Rangers under the guidance of Charles Goodnight. Her eldest son was the famous Quana Parker, who took his surname, by Comanche custom, from his mother. This chief at last became head of all Comanches, and the town of Quana, Texas is named after him. It is not strange that this warlike tribe should chafe under the conditions as they existed nor that, late in December of 1876, a band of Comanches numbering 170 warriors under Black Horse, or Tu Ukama, with their families should leave Fort Sill and head toward the Staked Plains. Two troops of cavalry pursued them, but lost their trail when a heavy snow came unexpectedly. That winter, Black Horse's band camped in Thompson's Canyon, an opening in the escarpment of the Staked Plains. It was an ideal location, with plentiful game, protected from the elements, and far enough from the nearest buffalo hunter's camp so that nobody expected the Indians' presence. In the latter part of February, 1877, a few of the young Comanche braves went on the prowl and came on some outlying hunter's camp close at hand. John F. Cook and Rankin Moore camped with the Benson outfit south of the Red River, were the first to see the enemy. A solitary Indian sneaked up on Cook and tried to shoot him from ambush. He missed and escaped, but not until he had dodged a perfect spray of bullets from Cook and Moore. The incident disturbed the buffalo hunters. Warnings were sent all around. Late that evening came a report that Marshal Soule, whose camp was near the escarpment, had been killed. On the same day, the camp of Bill Devins was raided. Although his men escaped with their lives and their weapons, the Indians captured all their ammunitions and supplies. That was February 22nd, Washington's birthday. Rath's store on Double Mountain Creek 
was the natural gathering place of the hunters, and thither they went as fast as they were warned. A tall, raw-boned Texan, Pat Garrett by name, was largely responsible for carrying the word of warnings, riding scores of miles to tell outlying camps of their danger. It was this same Pat Garrett, who later as sheriff of Lincoln County, New Mexico, was to put an end to the career of the notorious outlaw, Billy the Kid. Nearly 300 hunters gathered at Rats, and a council of war was held. It was voted, first, to send a party of 18 volunteers to Soul's camp and see if he was really dead. The party made the trip and found the scalped and mutilated body of the hunter. They buried him and returned to the post. Rath's bartender was Limpy Jim Smith. He was an ex-road agent from Montana and had escaped from that country just ahead of the vigilantes who broke up the plumber gang and carried a bullet in his leg to his dying day. But he was a man of nerve and courage. He proposed that the hunters organize. At the proposal, one Tom Lumpkins cried out that he hadn't lost any engines and didn't propose to hunt any. The remark brought sharp words between Lumpkins and Smith, which culminated a month later in a gunfight and the death of Lumpkins. Most of the hunters favored the sending of a punitive expedition against the Comanches. If anybody had the nerve to suggest an appeal to the army, he was laughed to scorn. The buffalo hunters knew how to handle this themselves. Forty-five volunteered to go, which was considered a sufficient number. Among the hunters was Big Hank Campbell, an old Indian fighter. He had been one of the leaders on the Sapa Creek Massacre in 1875, when a band of Cheyennes was wiped out by buffalo hunters and soldiers in northern Kansas. He was elected commander. Limpy Jim Smith was also elected one of the leaders. The third was Joe Freed. The expedition set out the next day. 30 hunters were mounted, 15 on foot to guard the wagons, which carried 250 rounds of ammunition for every man, besides bar lead, powder, primers, and reloading outfits. They had with them Jose, an English-speaking Mexican who had scouted for General McKenzie in 1874 and knew the country thoroughly. Ben Jackson, as quartermaster, issued grain, and Shorty Woodson, tallest, slimmest man on the range, a former druggist, took charge of the medicine supply. The roster was kept by Powderface Hudson, with the guards detailed in rotation. Most of the men had been soldiers in either the Union or Confederate armies. The whole thing was handled in thorough military fashion. All told, it was one of the best equipped and outfitted expeditions ever to go against the Indians, the army expeditions included. The men carried their long-range heavy caliber Sharps Buffalo guns, with which, by continuous practice, they had become wonderful judges of distance and could shoot extremely accurate by raising a muzzle without adjusting the rear graduated sights. Just before they started, another bunch of hunters came from the Gaudi's camp. There were 15 or 20 of them, and they carried in one badly wounded man, Spotted Jack, while two or three others were slightly wounded. There were only three horses among them. This was the story told. The previous day, while camped on their way to Rath's Rendezvous, a band of Comanches headed by Black Horse himself had stampeded their entire horse herd, except for three animals. Badly outnumbered, they had counted 60 hostile war bonnets. They opened fire. The buffalo guns did good execution. A couple of Comanche turned flip-flops in the sun as the ounce slugs hit them and the rest took to cover. Most of that day, completely surrounded, they fought against the odds of more than three to one. Every once in a while, they could hear the heavy report of a buffalo gun, whose dull roar formed a contrast to the sharper cracks of the Winchesters most of the Indians carried. This meant the party was the same which had killed Soul and carried off his gun. In the afternoon, Moccasin Jim, one of the hunters, got a bead on the Comanche who was using Soul's gun and drilled him. The Indian crumpled up. Another Comanche snaked through the bushes and got the gun. It was soon busy again. The hunters were certain they killed at least three of the Comanches, probably more. Three or more of their own number were wounded by this time. Old Gotti finally rose and said, Well boys, this is no place to be tonight. Let's pack up. In spite of the redoubled fire of the Indians, the Stark hunters arose, walked down the trail, and leaving the Comanches behind, joined with their fellows at Rath's. Marshal Soule had been universally respected, 
and liked by the Buffalo Hunters. John R. Cook, one of them, later wrote, He was an educated man, a native of Pennsylvania. He was a man who possessed a useful fund of information. He was not obtrusive, but courteous and polite, respected others' opinions even when he differed from them. He was not a professed Christian, but believed in the observance of the golden rule. Why should he have been taken when such men as Hurricane Bill, Dutch Henry, Squaw Johnny, and some others that I had in mind could roam these prairies disregarding the law and morality with a price placed on some of their own heads? The expedition started at last. At the edge of the Staked Plains, on the escarpment, they had great difficulty in getting their wagons to the top. This was finally done by passing along its base until they reached a narrow winding, steep incline, where by doubling the teams, they finally reached the upper level. Here they found an Indian trail, dim, it is true, but still a trail. Congratulating themselves on their luck, they started in pursuit. It seems almost incredible to think that this handful of men were actually gleeful as they took the trail of an Indian band containing many times their number of warriors to carry war to their vastly superior foe. But the buffalo hunters, each a hair's breadth shot from his heavy rifle, each endowed with a reckless disregard for his own life, were probably, man for man, the most formidable individuals who ever trod this continent. The whole day was spent ferreting out the dim trail. That night they came upon the traces of a camp where they found two burned teepees. This meant two men had died, and they thus were able to determine the extent of the damage done by Gotti's outfit. At mid-afternoon the next day, Jose, riding ahead with Cook and Louis Keyes, located the hostile camp. Back they went to warn the hunters. That night, the audacious white men made their camp within two or three miles of the Indian village, in a gorge which hid their wagons and horses. As a camp was being made, Jose saw an Indian cross the canyon and ride the back trail. If he discovered their track, the Comanches would break camp at once and be hard to catch. To stop him was vital. Louis Keyes was a half-breed Cherokee. He now daubed his cheeks with red paint and snaked out to intercept the rider. On came the Comanche. Suddenly a rifle rang out. The Indian whirled out of his saddle. The shot had been fired, not by Keyes, but by an Englishman, a member of poor Sewell's outfit. The Indian got up and started to run zigzagging. It was useless for him to attempt to escape. The hunters killed him and hid his body among the tall reeds near the water hole. Hank Campbell now gave his simple orders. The wagons and camp outfit were to be left where they were. Three fighting divisions were named. Campbell commanded half the mounted men, Limpy Jim the other half, and Joe Freed the dismounted men. Old Man Gotti with Cook and Jose were to scout the Indians. Smith's men were to charge through the village and run off the pony herd. Then the hunters expected with supreme self-confidence to exterminate the whole Comanche outfit. Although they were admonished by Campbell not to kill any women or children if they could help it. Darkness came, and the three scouts, their horses' hooves muffled with grain sacks, started up the canyon. By lighting a match under a blanket, they were able from time to time to examine the trail. It was perilous in the extreme, and the nerves were keyed to high tension. The whir of a disturbed bird, a stumble of an involuntary cough, or a sneeze might mean their deaths. Near morning, they discovered the camp. Cook rode back to bring the hunters. Broad daylight, on March 18th, the three divisions of the hunters, approximately 15 men each, stopped at the head of the Pocket Canyon where the Comanche village stood. There, Campbell arranged the mounted platoons between 200 yards apart with the infantry between. Everybody was ready. All right, shouted Campbell. Go for them, yelled Limpy Jim, the ex-road agent. Forward swept the hunters. There were many stalwart fighters in their line. John Cook, a veteran Indian scout, Joe Jackson, an ex-Confederate soldier, Squirrel Eye, another ex-rebel, Lee Grimes, taciturn and dour, Louis Keyes, the Cherokee, now beginning his war chant. As they began to move, Keyes uttered a war whoop, and Squirrel Eye gave the old rebel yell. Then, shouting like mad, the hunters charged. The Indian teepees came into view. The Comanches were seen running out to a low hill from which they began shooting rapidly at about 200 yards. 
it was death to continue into the teeth of that fire. Hank Campbell, riding like a crazy man, headed the hunters and yelled at them to fall back to the canyon. Before they could obey, Joe Jackson flopped from his saddle and Lee Grimes was down, his horse shot out from under him and his wrist broken. Devins and Cook leaped from their horses and ran to Jackson, whom they began dragging to a place of safety. A sharp cry from Devins and he dropped his hold. A Comanche bullet had shattered his arm. For God's sake, gasped the wounded Jackson, lie down or they'll get you all. Grimes crept up and the four of them, three of them hurt, listened to the death whispering above them. Hank Campbell's men down in the draw did not see the new menace slipping up on them. They were so much interested in the fight on their front that the band of more than a hundred warriors creeping up the gorge toward them on the north escaped their attention. But Cook and the wounded hunters forced to lie out on their exposed situation saw them. Their sudden shooting revealed the move. Campbell's men turned their rifles and the Comanches retreated, dragging six of their number with them. Cook, Devins, and Grimes crawled down from their perilous location, taking the helpless Jackson with them. All chance of capturing the Comanche herd was gone. Now the Comanches mounted and swept about the white men in a wide circle. The latter scattered to the places of advantage. Part of them faced clear around to meet the attack from the rear. Whooping and yelling, the Indians flashed across one draw opening after another, the hunter's rifles shooting like mad. Several horses went down. A warrior, his pony shot out from under him, ran for the ravine. He had 30 yards to go, and the heavy slugs from buffalo guns ripped the sod all around him. All at once, he was flat on the ground. The hunters turned their rifles elsewhere. Grizzled Hank Campbell and Limpy Jim Smith held a conference. Then Campbell spoke. Boys, you must leave this place. Smith will take the horses and the wounded men down the side ravine to the long water hole. The rest of us will crawl to the crest and fire at the camp until Joe Freed can get his footmen out of the mess they are in. The whole aspect of the fight had changed. Instead of a joyful campaign of annihilation, it had become a grim struggle for life, with the odds heavily in the favor of death. Campbell's sharpshooters crept to the crest. About 400 yards away was the Comanche camp in plain view, with a big bunch of horses behind it. Among the teepees, 50 or 60 ponies with Travoy were being loaded by the squaws. Off to the left was a tall pole with a red flag flying from it, some Indian signal. To the right was an Indian working with his looking glass to flash messages to his comrades. Camp Bell's hunters fired a couple of long distant volleys at the camp. Then like a swarm of bees, a fusillade of bullets buzzed over their heads. Let the camp alone and comb the grass at the crest of this side of it, ordered Campbell. From end to end, that crest was swept with bullets, about 300 rounds being fired at it. Then the shooting at the camp began again. The cool hunters, with their tobacco quids in their cheeks, deliberately picking special targets to shoot at. By this time, Joe Freed and his men had returned to the main body. Poor Jose, the Mexican scout, was shot through the shoulder but wore a grin on his face. Jose told them he had picked a hornet's nest indeed. Instead of 75 or 100 Comanches, there were nearly 300 warriors fighting them. Another camp was just around the bend of the canyon, with a big band of Plains, Lipan, Apaches, allied with the Comanches for years. But Campbell, the indomitable Scott, merely laughed. Maybe we bit off a bit more than we can chew, was his only comment. The Indian fire suddenly died down. Something was up. Black smoke sprang up and advanced down the draw. The Indians had set the prairie grass ablaze. Right behind the smoke dashed a daring young warrior, wearing a magnificent war bonnet and riding a speedy white horse. Directly across their front he rode, drawing the fire of half of the men, some of whom shot the second or third time before the running horse fell. Then under the fusillade from the crest, the daring brave quickly crumbled up and was still. Far down the draw, waving their lances and uttering the demonic Comanche scream, which once heard is never forgotten, came a band of Indians. They halted at long rifle range. Their purpose was to draw the attention from where the real attack was being prepared, but they failed to catch the hunters off their guard. Suddenly, through the grass smoke of the upper draw, came a magnificent swooping rush of the Comanches. The smoke screened their movements until they broke through it. 
Then the roar of buffalo guns crashed out. Many warriors went down and the Indians drew off. The wounded white men were calling for water now. During the lull which followed the charge through the smoke screen, Ben Jackson, brother of the wounded Joe and Cook, volunteered to get some water from a hole 50 yards away. With their comrades shooting over their heads to keep down the Indian fire, they crawled to the spring and came back with their boots filled with the precious liquid. Shorty, the druggist, had bound up the wounds and given each wounded man a big drink of fourth proof whiskey. It was noted that the Indians had disappeared. Cautiously, scouts advanced to their first position. Then came the surprise. The wily Comanches had tricked them. The whole camp was gone. The Indians had escaped. The buffalo hunters did not try to pursue. They were burdened by wounded. But more than that, they were devotedly thankful to be alive after their attack. They craved no further experience of the kind. Poor Jackson was in particularly bad shape. The bullet which had struck him in the groin was from Soul's buffalo gun, which the Indians used throughout the fight. Jackson lived until he got to the camp, but died a little later. Weeks later, they found out the extent of the damage they had done. Captain P. L. Lee, with a troop of 10th Cavalry, rounded up the Comanches near Lake Cuamato. After a brief fight in which he killed four of them, both Black Horse and his wife were among the dead he reported. But this report was an error. Black Horse, also known as Paco Ria, or Colt, and Ta Pekka, Sunrays, lived for many years afterward and died at Cache, Oklahoma about 1900. The leader killed at Lake Cuamado, the Ek Awakane, young red man, was not a chief, but is remembered by the old Comanches as an extremely fearless and reckless warrior who absolutely refused to surrender and never went on the reservation. Nevertheless, despite the discrepancies in the report, the Indians were ready to surrender. Lee learned that the hunters had killed 31 Indians in the fight, mortally wounded four more, and seriously wounded 22. 15 pack horses were killed in the camp during the battle. Lee also found out something else. Soul's buffalo gun was a hoodoo to the Comanches. Everyone who used it had been killed or wounded. The first Indian who used it was killed. The second, badly wounded. Then Black Horse's son took it and he too died with the gun in his hands. Five Feathers used it until the near close of the fight when he too was killed. After that, the Indians would not use it. They left it wrapped in a blanket with two scalp locks they had taken from Soul's head. It was found by Lee's men. The Comanches never went on the warpath after that campaign. It was planned, carried out, and fought by buffalo hunters, but it could not have been more effective had it been executed by the best of trained soldiers. Well, we hope you enjoyed that little story. Based off a poll I made a couple weeks ago, y'all seem to really enjoy the Indian War material. And if you want to, go ahead and drop a suggestion in the comments section on which Indian War material I should do next. Whether it should be from tribes on the plains, the southwest, northwest, or even those east of the Mississippi River. Next time at Doors the Walrus, we'll continue down the trail west, beginning in Independence, Missouri, and ending in Salt Lake as we ride the Mormon Trail. We hope to see you then.